Welcome to The Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. In the dark of the Berkshire night, someone was shouting, Fire! It awoke Mr. Charles Southmaid from his sound sleep. The 70-year-old lawyer bound from his bed toward the door, but upon swinging it open, he didn't see flames. Instead, there stood a man, the lower half of his face covered in fine black cloth. It was this figure, that of a tall, young, strong man, who lunged at Charles. But despite valiantly trying to fight the strange intruder off, the older man was unable to keep his feet and was thrown with great force to the floor. The stranger rummaged hurriedly through the room, found $200, and made his getaway. This would be the first theft of many, and the young robber's tactics would change. On a calm October day in 1892, a widow worked around her quiet home at the edge of Stockbridge. A tall figure, the lower half of his face covered, surprised her, having secretly entered while she was unawares. The woman began to panic until the man spoke, but it wasn't what he said that calmed her fears, but rather the way he said it. She described his tone as soothing. He demanded money from her and threatened the old woman with a gun. Unfortunately for her, it just so happened that she'd recently taken a hundred dollars out of the bank. The stranger took the money, in a soft tone reassured her that she'd be all right, which the widow couldn't seem to help herself from being calmed by, and then he ran off, and it happened again. A few days later, Mrs. Moore found a man in her bedroom at night. Not a normal occurrence, seeing as how she too was a widow. Like the victim before her, she had just gotten a large sum of money, and the tall man wanted it. She described him, saying he was about six feet tall. A handkerchief covered the lower half of his face, fine clothes, and small soft hands. But most of all that his voice spoke in a suave and gentle tone. Again, the man made a clean getaway. In September of that year, the New York Times called it a reign of terror. And... No one, unless he has visited the town, can understand or realize how deep-seated and widespread has become the terror diffused through Stockbridge, that this historic village, redolent with its reminiscence and intellectual vigor, should be cowed by one man, is incredible to the average native Massachusetts citizen. In Park Cottage, Park is spelt with a silent E at the end, on Main Street, Stockbridge, this masked man robbed Mrs. Swan and Miss Stetson. Miss Stetson described the thief as every inch the gentleman, and said that his voice was low, soothing, musical, and even mesmeric in its effect. The men of Stockbridge began nightly patrols, and the Somerset, those of means who could come up for the season to their enormous summer cottages, left the Berkshire Mountains early, heading back to the cities and taking their valuables with them. And maybe it worked for a little while. But next summer, as soon as they were back, the robberies began again. The largest reward offered for information leading to the criminal's capture was $1,350. The crimes, and who might be the culprit, was all that was on the minds of the people of the area at the time. The newly founded Stockbridge Night Watch and the police they tried to help had no end of theories as to who might be responsible. They thought it could have been a servant from one of the wealthy households who might know who had what money coming to them and who owned which desired pieces of jewelry. But the burglar also awoke a family with a loud uncorking of a champagne bottle and no self-respecting servant could be suspected after that. But Laura Field was having none of it. She was asleep one night in her bedroom when she awoke to the feeling of a hand pressed hard over her mouth. Someone's other hand rummaged around the covers looking for hidden valuables. Laura was shot through with fear when she opened her eyes and in the dim light of night saw there a man, his face half covered 
and then the man's hand grasped upon a watch that she had placed for safekeeping under her pillow. It was the custom of the time for women to obey the reasonable demands of a man, but not this lady. Anger quickly took place of her fear, and she leapt forward, wrapping her arms around his neck. He stepped away from the bed, and her feet couldn't even touch the floor. There, dangling from his shoulders, she shouted, You shan't have my watch! To this action, the man put a gun against her head, and said, Be quiet, or I'll shoot you. The watch in dispute was worth quite a sum of money, even by today's standards. And she wasn't backing down. They bickered back and forth. He threatened again and again to harm her, and she called his bluff. Shoot! Don't mind me. Shoot! She yelled. Her valet came running and entered the room with a pistol drawn. But, like a good man of his age, upon noticing that he was in nothing but his underclothes in front of a lady, he ran back to his room, saying that he would fetch his robe. The strange man was finally able to dislodge Laura enough to throw her against the wall. Her weight removed, he headed for the front door. The valet, finally back from fetching more proper attire, followed closely, firing a shot through the door as the stranger escaped into the night. After that, the locksmiths in and around Stockbridge had never been so much in demand. Business was booming. On October 27th, the gentleman burglar took advantage of a party at the Sedgwick house. He found his way to the wine cellar and helped himself to what he pleased. That same night, he hit two more homes, four shops in the village, and even threatened someone walking by with his gun and got from him a cool fifty cents. Soon, though, Stockbridge was too much on alarm, and he headed one town north to Lennox, where he robbed the rectory of the Trinity Church. But he wasn't alone for this crime. He brought his entire gang. They woke the Reverend's whole family and made them stand still in a hall while they searched the house for anything of value. Then they stole some horses from the nearby barn and took off into the darkness. Now it was the locksmiths of Lennox who hurried to work. Seven months would pass before, in Long Island City, Queens, Detective Sergeant Stephen O'Brien and his team arrested a man named Michael Sherlock, along with a few of his shady friends, one of them named William Mahoney. They'd been breaking into homes around Long Island for a little while by then, and their tactics seemed very similar to those that had unfolded back north in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. New Year's Eve was when they were found and arrested just at the gate for the 34th Street Ferry. It said that Sherlock had nearly fainted when he saw all of the officers with their pistols drawn. Oh, but it wouldn't be that easy. For at the same time, another group was arrested in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The leader of this ragtag team was named Thomas Kinsella, who just happened to have been born in 1857 and raised in Stockbridge. It was suspected that he might know Sherlock and his gang. His own family lived back in Stockbridge still, on Goodrich Street. He also had a very sad and shadowy past, which included the accidental killing of his first mother-in-law. Her name was Elizabeth Bannon, and he served from 1887 to 1890 for manslaughter. His life had been hard in other ways, too. He may have grown up in a well-to-do town, but he was an orphan. After finishing school, he'd become a stonemason and worked on some of the great cottages in the area. But in the 1880s, four of his seven children with his first wife, Mary, died, all within 13 months. And Thomas was left distraught. An article in the Valley Gleaner, January 21st, 1885, the family of Thomas Kinsella Jr. of Goodrich Street buried on Thursday last one of their bright twin boys, aged five and a half years. Same paper on January 28, 1885. At most, there have been but two cases of diphtheria in town the present season. One that was noticed was the twin son of Thomas Kinsella Jr., 
who died two weeks since, and his twin brother who has it lightly, again, on February 4th, 1885. Thomas Kinsella Jr. and family are doubly afflicted by the death of their fine little boy Jimmy, twin brother of the little Tommy, who died two weeks previous. The second child was recovering from diphtheria when congestion of the lungs set in, and, being much reduced in strength by the former terrible disease, the little fellow soon followed his brother to the better land. The death took place Wednesday morning at an early hour, and the burial occurred the same day in the afternoon. And on February 11th, 1885, the third child, a little girl three years of age, of Thomas Kinsella, Jr., died and was buried last Thursday. His three little ones all died of that terrible disease, diphtheria, in about three weeks' time. A small babe is still left to these afflicted parents, and as it has not yet shown any symptoms of the disease, it is hoped that it may escape the fate of the other three. But that's not even the end of the heartbreak. Thomas also lost two of his brothers and a sister-in-law, as well as two nephews and three nieces, as well as yet another little baby of his own that died just after birth. When he was arrested, the article from the Lee Gleaner, dated March 7th, 1894, read, Stockbridge burglar Thomas Kinsella, convicted in Bridgeport. Some months ago, a series of burglaries were committed on Long Island, in which figured a gentleman burglar whose methods and manner corresponded so closely with those of the famous Stockbridge burglar that a New York paper devoted several columns to tracing the similarities between the different cases. The suspicions then aroused were strengthened by the fact that Thomas Kinsella, formerly of Stockbridge, was last week convicted of burglary at Bridgeport and was sentenced to 15 years in state prison. Kinsella, with two pals, was captured in the house of John M. Wheeler at Bridgeport early Thursday morning. They have all been connected with marked burglaries committed in the vicinity of Long Island City as well as Bridgeport. There were three in the gang, Mahoney and Kinsella pled guilty to the Wheeler burglary and were sentenced to state prison for 15 years each. They are already behind bars. The third man had been shot by the police officer at the time of the capture, and it is doubtful if he ever recovers. The spokesman of the gang, in all its operations and probably its leader, was Kinsella, who is described as a pleasant-voiced man with a gentle manner, whose bearing toward his victims was one of excessive politeness. Some years ago, Kinsella had a row with his mother-in-law in Stockbridge, during which a revolver was discharged. As a result, the woman died. Kinsella claimed that the shooting was accidental. He was convicted of manslaughter and served a term of two and a half years in state prison. He was also mixed up in a horse-stealing case and is suspected of having shot a policeman in a Massachusetts town where he once lived. He is the only man of the three who has a bad record. He is married and has several children. Law enforcement found some of the stolen articles in the possession of the gang attached to Michael Sherlock including that watch that was stolen from under Laura's pillow. It was suspected that at the time of the Gentleman Thief episode in Stockbridge, the two teams had been in fact one, and that the whole lot were involved. In the end, everyone did time. It was presumed that Sherlock was the Gentleman Thief, but that Kinsella had his own hand in numerous Connecticut robberies. It was determined that Sherlock was the actual burglar, the one that wore the mask. Because of his tall height, his small, well-manicured hands, and of course, his smooth, alluring voice. Sherlock was questioned about the activities and ranks of those people suspected to be involved, but he refused to give up a single detail. He told the interrogators that if he were to rat out on his comrades, his life wouldn't be worth a copper. It was Jenny Kinsella who broke the silence. She was Thomas Kinsella's second wife. She claimed that the gang was managed by her husband, but that a man named Edward Fitzpatrick was the next in command, and that Sherlock was third. She named names and pointed out robberies that she knew of. But after some hard partying under the watchful eye of a guard sent to protect her, she was found dead 
on July 19th, before she could testify. Perhaps that's what Sherlock had been afraid would happen to him. Despite her absence, Sherlock received 15 years in Charleston prison. Kinsella got about the same, and in 1909, after being freed, is shown to have become a stonemason again. But he'd die after being committed by his son to the Northampton State Hospital, a hospital for those with mental disturbances, in 1932. He was buried in Stockbridge, it's said, but it's not known where. The town of Stockbridge has never quite let go of the episode. The idea of the gentleman burglar, whoever he might actually have been, if not a few men, continued to thrill and mesmerize residents for decades to come. People loved to theorize on who might have worn the mask, on which nights, who pulled off which heist. Was it all one man behind the disguise? Or did they trade off the task for different nights and for different strengths? Plays with different depictions were performed in the area into the 1970s. Truly, though, we are far too removed to ever really know who wore that mask. And so, the mystery will have to remain. Honestly, I think that's the way most of us would prefer it. This has been The Berkshires Gone By. Created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. If you'd like to contact us, find more episodes, or see images relating to our topics, please visit our Facebook page, or head to our new website at www.theberkshiresgoneby.com. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.